Lecture 5, Peter's Defection at Antioch, Galatians 2 verses 11-21 By H. A. Ironside But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid! For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Verses 11-21 This passage suggests a number of interesting considerations. First of all, we are rather astonished perhaps to find Paul and Peter, both inspired men, both commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ to go out into the world proclaiming His Gospel, both apostles, now sharply differing one from the other. It would suggest certainly that the Apostle Peter, who is the one at fault, is not the rock upon which the church is built. What a wobbly kind of a rock it would be if he were, for here is the very man to whom the Father gave that wonderful revelation that Christ was the Son of the living God, actually behaving in such a way at Antioch as to bring discredit upon the gospel of the grace of God. If Peter was the first pope he was a very fallible one, not an infallible. But he himself knew nothing of any such position, for he tells us in the fifth chapter of his first epistle that he was a fellow elder with the rest of the elders in the church of God, not one set in a position of authority over the presbytery, the elders. In God's church chapter then too the reading of the scripture suggests to us the tremendous importance of ever being on the alert lest in some way or another we compromise in regard to God's precious truth. We have already seen what an important thing that truth was in the eyes of the Apostle Paul when he could call down condign judgment on the man, or even the angel, who preaches any other gospel than that divine revelation communicated to him. We know it was not simply because of ill-temper that he wrote in this way but because he realized how important it is to hold the faith which was once, for all, delivered unto the saints, Jude 3. That explains his attitude here in regard to Peter, a brother apostle. It had been agreed, as we have seen, at the great council in Jerusalem that Peter was to go to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles, but as they compared their messages they found that one did not contradict the other, that both taught and believed salvation was through faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that both recognized the futility of works of law as providing a righteousness for sinful men. To Antioch, a Gentile city in which there was a large church composed mainly of Gentile believers, where Paul and Barnabas had been laboring for a long time, Peter came for a visit. I suppose he was welcomed with open arms. It must have been a very joyous thing for the Apostle Paul to welcome Peter, and to be his fellow laborer in ministering the Word of God to these people of Antioch. At first they had a wonderfully happy time. Together they went in and out of the homes of the believers and sat down at the same tables with Gentile Christians. Peter was once so rigid a Jew that he could not even think of going into the house of a Gentile to have any fellowship whatsoever. What a happy thing it was to see these different believers, some at one time Jews, and others once Gentiles, now members of one body, the body of Christ, 
enjoying fellowship together, not only at the Lord's table, but also in their homes. For when Paul speaks of eating with Gentiles I take it that it was at their own tables where they could have the sweetest Christian fellowship talking together of the things of God while enjoying the good things that the Lord provides. But unhappily there came in something that hindered, that spoiled that hallowed communion. Some brethren came from Jerusalem who were of the rigid Pharisaic type, and although they called themselves, and possibly were, Christians, they had never been delivered from legalism. Peter realized that his reputation was at stake. If they should find him eating with Gentile believers and go back to Jerusalem and report this, it might shut the door on him there, and so prudently, as he might have thought, he withdrew from them, he no longer ate with them. If he chose not to eat with the Gentiles, could any one find fault with him for that? If he regarded the prejudices of these brethren might he not be showing a certain amount of Christian courtesy? He felt free to do these things, but not if they distressed these others. But Paul saw deeper than that, he saw that our liberty in Christ actually hung upon the question of whether one would sit down at the dinner table or not with those who had come out from the Gentiles unto the name of our Lord Jesus, and so this controversy. When Peter was come to Antioch, Paul says, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. There is no subserviency on Paul's part here, no recognition of Peter as the head of the church. Paul realized that a divine authority was vested in him, and that he was free to call in question the behavior of Peter himself though he was one of the original twelve. For before that certain came from James, James was the leader at Jerusalem, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. We read in the Old Testament, The fear of man bringeth a snare, and here we are rather surprised to find the Apostle Peter, some years after Pentecost, afraid of the face of man. It has often been said that Peter before Pentecost was a coward, but when he received the Pentecostal baptism everything was changed. He stood before the people in Jerusalem and drove the truth home to them, ye, killed the Prince of Life, and he who had denied his Lord because of the fear of man now strikes home the fact that they denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. Acts 3 verse 14 The inference has been drawn by some that if one receives the Pentecostal baptism he will never be a coward again, and also that all inbred sin has been then burned out by the refining fire of God. But we do not find anything like that in the Word of God. It is true that under the influence of that Pentecostal baptism Peter did not fear the face of man, but now he had begun to slip. The fact that one has received great spiritual blessing at any particular time gives no guarantee that he will never fear again. We now find Peter troubled by that same old besetment that had brought him into difficulty before, afraid of what others will say of him, and when he saw these legalists he forgot all about Pentecost, all about the blessing that had come, all about the marvelous revelation that he had when the sheet was let down from heaven and the Lord said, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common, Acts 10 verse 15. He forgot how he himself had stood in Cornelius' household and said, It is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to, come unto one of another nation, but God hath shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean, Acts 10 verse 28. He forgot that at the council in Jerusalem it was he who stood before them all and after relating the incidents in connection with his visit to Cornelius, exclaimed, We, we who are Jews by nature, believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they, Acts 15 verse 11. Emphasis added. That was a wonderful declaration. We might have expected him to say, We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. They shall be saved, even as we, that is, these Gentiles may be saved by grace even as we Jews are saved by grace. But no, he had had a wonderful revelation of the real meaning of Pentecost and this glorious dispensation of the grace of God. What made him forget all this? The scowling looks of these men from Jerusalem. They had heard that he had been exercising a liberty in which they did not believe, and they had come to watch him. He thought, it will never do for me to go into the houses of the Gentiles to eat while these men are around. 
So without thinking how he would offend these simple Gentile Christians who had known the Lord only a short time, and in order to please these Jerusalem legalists, he withdrew from the Gentiles as far as intimate fellowship was concerned. He was not alone in this for he was a man of influence and others followed him. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. It looked as though there might be two churches in Antioch very soon, one for the Jews and another for the Gentiles, as though the middle wall of partition had not been broken down. The other Jews dissembled likewise with him. And what must have cut Paul to the quick, his own intimate companion, his fellow worker, the man who had understood so well from the beginning the work that he should do, Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. How much he puts into those words! Barnabas who knew so much better, Barnabas who had seen how mightily God had wrought among the Gentiles, and who knew that all this old legalistic system had fallen never to be raised again, even Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation. Dissimulation is rather a fine-sounding word. I wonder why the translators did not translate the Greek word the same as they generally did in other places in the Bible. It may have been that they did not like to use the other word in connection with a man like Barnabas. It is just the ordinary word for hypocrisy. The other Jews, became hypocrites, likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their, hypocrisy. Peter might have said, We are doing this to glorify God, but it was nothing of the kind, it was downright hypocrisy in the sight of God. Paul recognized it as what it was, and said, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all. This was not a clandestine meeting, there was no backbiting. What he had to say he said openly, and he did not seem to spare Peter's feelings. We must ever remember the word, Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor, and not suffer sin upon him. Leviticus 19:17. Some years afterward he wrote to Timothy, Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear, 1 Timothy 5 verse 20. There was too much at stake to pass over this lightly. It was too serious a matter to settle quietly with Peter in a corner, for it had been a public scandal, and it called in question the liberty of Gentiles in Christ and so must be settled in a public way. One can imagine the feelings of Peter, noble man of God that he was, and yet he had been carried away with this snare. At first he was startled as he looked at Paul, and then I fancy with bowed head, the blood mantling his face in shame, he realized how guilty he was of seeking to please these legalists who would rob the church of the marvelous gospel of grace. If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? He has let the cat out of the bag. I think I see those Jewish men look up and say, What is this? He has been living after the manner of Gentiles? Yes, they should have known it for he had a right to do it. God had given all men this liberty and Peter had been exercising it, but now he was bringing himself into bondage. Peter had said, We Jews know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but we have to be saved by grace even as the Gentiles, so why insist upon bringing these Gentiles under bondage to Jewish forms and ceremonies? Paul went on, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We gave up all confidence in law-keeping as a means of salvation when we turned to Christ, and now, Peter, would you by your behavior say to the Gentile brethren, you should come under the bondage of law-keeping, from which we have been delivered in order to be truly justified? It was a solemn occasion, for there was an important question at stake, and Paul handled it like the courageous man that he was. Are you, like so many others, trying to do the best you can in order to obtain God's salvation? Listen then to what he says, By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Could my tears forever flow, could my zeal no langer know, these for sin could not atone, thou must save, and thou alone. 
Some years ago, after listening to me preach on the street corner a man said to me, I detest this idea that through the death and righteousness of another I should be saved. I do not want to be indebted to anybody for my salvation. I am not coming to God as a mendicant, but I believe that if a man lives up to the Sermon on the Mount and keeps the Ten Commandments, God does not require any more of him. I asked, my friend, have you lived up to the Sermon on the Mount and have you kept the Ten Commandments? Oh, he said, perhaps not perfectly, but I am doing the best I can. But, I replied, the Word of God says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all, James 2 verse 10. And, it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, Galatians 3 verse 10, and because you have not continued you are under the curse. That is all the law can do for any poor sinner. It can only condemn, for it demands perfect righteousness from sinful men, a righteousness which no sinful man can ever give, and so when God has shown us in His Word that men are bereft of righteousness, He says, I have a righteousness for guilty sinners, but they must receive it by faith, and He tells us the wondrous story of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, He was delivered for our offenses. Romans 4 verse 25 And having trusted Him shall we go back to works of the law? If, says Paul, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, if we who have trusted in Jesus are still sinners seeking a way of salvation, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? Moses was the mediator of the law, and it was to be used by God to make sin become exceeding sinful. Is that all Christ is for? Is it simply that His glorious example is to show me how deep is my sin, how lost my condition, and then am I to save myself by my own efforts? Surely not. That would be but to make Christ a minister of sin, but Christ is a minister of righteousness to all who believe. I think verse 17, and possibly verse 18, concludes what Paul says to Peter. If I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. We do not have quotation marks in the ancient Greek text, so have no way of knowing exactly where Paul's words to Peter end, but probably he concluded his admonition to Peter with this word. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. What does he mean by that? He means that the law condemned me to death, but Christ took my place and became my substitute. I died in him. I through the law died to the law, that I might live unto God. Now I belong to a new creation altogether. And oh, the wonder of that new creation! The old creation fell in its head, Adam, and the new one stands eternally in its head, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not trying to work for our salvation, we are saved through the work that He Himself accomplished. We can look back to that cross upon which He hung, the bleeding victim, in our stead, and we can say in faith, I am crucified with Christ. It is as though my life had been taken, He took my place, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. As I was identified with Him in His death on the cross now I am linked with Him in resurrection life, for He has given me to be a partaker of His own glorious eternal life. Nevertheless I live, yet not I. It is not the old, I, come back to life again, but Christ liveth in me. He, the glorious One, is my real life, and that, life which I now live in the flesh, my experience down here as a Christian man in the body, I live, not by putting myself under rules and regulations and trying to keep the law of the Ten Commandments but, by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, and gave Himself for me. As I am occupied with Him, my life will be the kind of life which He approves. The Son of God, who loved me, and gave Himself for me. I wish each of us might say those words over in his heart. Can you say it in your heart? It is not, the Son of God, who loved the world, and gave Himself for the world, but, the Son of God, who loved me, and gave Himself for me. Only those who trust Him can speak like that. Can you say it from your heart? If you have never said it before you can look up into His face today, and say it for the first time. And so Paul concludes this section, 
I do not frustrate the grace of God, or, I will not set it aside, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. But because righteousness could not be found through legality, through self-effort, Christ gave Himself in grace for needy sinners, and He is Himself the righteousness of all who put their trust in Him.